Hello everybody! Today is August 23rd, 2022, and I am here with a pretty overdue movie collection update. Blu-rays and DVDs. Let's see here. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of this stuff comes back to like late May, so I've been sitting on a lot of these for a while. It has been busy. Work between both jobs this past two weeks have just been nuts and Flashback Weekend happened, and none of the pickups I got from Flashback Weekend are included with this. Just because I've been so busy since then, I still have not had a chance to watch anything that I bought at Flashback Weekend. Watch that video if you're more interested in that. That was a wonderful time a couple weeks ago. But anyways, you know what you're here for, so let's get right into it. Starting off, coming off of the hype of Top Gun Maverick, which I did see in the theater twice. Actually, really great movie. You'll certainly be seeing that here in one of these updates whenever that gets released. I think I saw it November 1st. So I was in a Tom Cruise mood. I decided to revisit Days of Thunder, which I had seen this before. My dad had a VHS tape of this way back in the day, so I remember I used to always watch this. We met Michael Rooker at a convention years ago, and the picture we had him autograph was from this movie. So... You know, what, what else can you say about Days of Thunder? You know, earlier Tom Cruise, great Nicole Kidman, Carrie Elways, great cast in this, Michael Rooker, as I said. Um, you know, I, I go back with a lot of these racing movies because for those of you who don't know, my dad used to be a race car driver, so spending a lot of little early childhood nights hanging out at the racetrack and stuff, these types of movies always had a soft spot for me. So Days of Thunder, great earlier post-Top Gun Tom Cruise movie, Tony Scott. Fun to revisit. I always like Days of Thunder. And uh, this is, I. it was summer, so I'm like, you know what, I'm going to bulk up and get a bunch of summer-looking movies. So a lot of these were pretty blind purchases, but I'm like, well, it's the summer, so let's get some beach movies in. And this one, which I had never heard of previously, it's a new Blu-ray that came out. See Thomas Howell and Peter Horton in Side Out. Uh, this is a Mill Creek Blu-ray. This one's alright, you know, it, it plays every single sports movie cliche that you can think of with the plot, with the characters. You know every beat of this and where it's gonna go. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, that's where some of the charm comes from. See Thomas Howell. Terry Kaiser is in it. Gotta love anything that Terry Kaiser's in. Not really too much, you know, special or extra about it. Like I said, it plays by a lot of the cliches. But, you know, for a summer beach movie, underdog sports movie, you know, why not? And same with this one. This is from the MVD Rewind Collection. Well, I don't own too many of their releases, but I really do like MVD. They do a good job with the movies and stuff they release. And this just sounded interesting. I had never heard of it previously, so I found this used for pretty cheap. It's an Australian movie, also with Nicole Kidman, called Wind Rider. And now this one, I, I was anticipating it to be like this, where it was just kind of a generic plot generic story but this was so goofy and weird it was actually a blast like this was a really fun watch it's an australian film and it stars this guy who is like a complete stalker and a complete psycho to nicole kidman and it, he has her kidnapped several times and there's all this really weird cartoony humor thrown around in this and and Nicole Kidman's a rock star, so there's all these music videos kind of built into it. It's a really strange one, but I, I was actually really entertained watching it. It, it. He works at like a robotics place, so there's all the, these robot hijinks that happen with that. It's a weird one, and I, I've even got a poster of it, too, in here, so, so that's fun. So, yeah, for something I never heard of that I'm like, oh, let's check this out, see what this is like. It was a... Uh, it was a very goofy, fun B movie time. I, I really there's like a car chase sequence in it that's really strange, and <laughs> th th this is a fun one. It, you might be riffing on it sometimes, but it was funny and it was entertaining. And 
I thought I'd be saying the same for this because I heard a lot of good remarks about it. It's got good press online. People seemed excited. And when I saw this title and I saw these two posters on the slipcover and the Blu-ray, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like my favorite purchase of the year. There's no way that... It's called Stunt Rock. And I heard a lot of good stuff about this. So I was ready. I'm like, oh, th this is right up my alley. It's got stunts. It's got rock. This is going to be awesome. I was getting vibes of, like, Action USA. So I'm like, oh, come on. And, guys, I got to tell you right now, I hated this. <laughs> it's it, it's not even a movie. It's, like, part concert film, part documentary, little bit of, like, love interest with the stuntman and these groupy girls he hangs out with there's all this archival documentary footage and the way it's cut and i it's it, it's incoherent the concert footage takes up about 80 percent of this movie movie i i did not like this guy i thought it was pointless when it was, the band first of all sucked the singer cannot sing to save his life and i love 70s rock yeah i grew up listening to the who but this i I don't see why this has such a cult following. I <laughs> Death Wish at 120 decibels. What, what the hell about this? There's nothing Death Wish about this. I don't. I, I, I normally this type of thing is right up my alley, but this I I thought it was fucking dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. The Paul Walker collection added this to it. Takers. Uh, a typical heist movie plays by a lot of the, you know, heist movie cliches, but Paul Walker, Idris Elba, and some of these, I know a lot of people, I was, Matt Dillon is like the cop, I know a lot of people were talking shit about T.I. and his performance in this, saying he was like the worst part. He was actually one of my favorite parts of this, just because he was chewing the scenery in every scene he was in. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's fine. I'm not really a fan of the way it ends. I think the third act, it kind of... Like, I wasn't... It it doesn't really leave you satisfied for either of a storyline. Like, you're following Matt Dillon's story, and you're following, like, Paul Walker and them, their story doing the actual heist. And I, it's underwhelming. It's not bad. It's got its moments that are pretty good. Some fun scenes. Matt Dillon, I especially like his character in this because he's such a jackass. But it's okay. A, a little underwhelming, but it's okay. This one I did a whole full-fledged unboxing video for because I got it with this whole package. I got an autographed slip cover for this too and another... Uh, there was a whole lot to this, but... The Crowning Jewel. I've been waiting for a Blu-ray for this for so long, and we finally got it thanks to Severn Films, and that's Faceless. I got the book that came with it, too. That had a very interesting press on this, as well as this autographed picture of Bridget, the actress, who plays Natalie, who I have that picture up on my wall over there. Uh, yeah, Faceless, I had the old Shriek Show DVD of this. I saw Faceless when I was way too... I saw it when I was like 12, I think, which this is not exactly a 12-year-old movie, but I always loved the soundtrack, the songs, especially the main Faceless song that plays. I think I counted nine times throughout the runtime of this. And you could watch my unboxing video. I talk about it a little bit more. I've always loved this. I love how this is such a sleazy, gory 80s slasher and a 60s detective story at the same time. Because the way this is filmed and, like, the Euro vibe of it, it totally comes off as, like, a 60s detective thriller when you're on the Chris Mitchum, Telly Savalas side of things. And then you get to the sleazy 80s romp, which is all taking place in this highly stylized, glossy, Parisian setting. And it wasn't until I watched this again recently when I got this Blu-ray that I noticed how satirical this film is. This It's more of a dark comedy than it is anything else. So much about this is like a dark comedy. And, <laughs> like, you're just watching this silly movie. The bodybuilder fight scene with Doodoo is ridiculous. And I'm very happy Severn Films, they finally corrected the print of the movie. So the final line of dialogue is in English. Because the Shriek Show DVD had some really weird 
wherever it was sourced from, the last line of the movie, which if you watch this, you'll know the last line is actually extremely important to the plot. It, it's kind of like a cliffhanger, but it's a, it was in French. It was from the French dub. And I was like, I remember my first time seeing the movie. I'm like, what? what? It's over? What, what was that? What did he say? And it, um, it, throughout the years, I had found out what it translated to, but it was good to finally hear the original audio of that. So, I mean, Faceless, I could talk about this one all day. It's crazy. It's batshit. But I always have a soft spot in my heart for Faceless. And I'm glad Seven Films gave it this awesome 4K slash Blu-ray release. Yeah. Yeah. Ch check it out. This one I really hadn't heard of. I, I wasn't going to the movies a whole lot around 2012, just because you know, I, I was getting into high school, all that stuff around then. And so I got this, sounded pretty promising, Premium Rush. And you know what? It was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed this one. It's a fun, the way a lot of it is filmed with the bike scenes and stuff, it's really well done. Stunt sequences and just the way it's filmed, getting in and out of the cars of the city. Michael Shannon is a blast as the corrupt cop in this that's on Joseph Gordon-Levitt's tail. There's a lot of funny scenes. It's a very lighthearted... The movie has a sense of humor to it. It doesn't really take itself too seriously. The only thing it does that... And this is just a pet peeve of mine with a lot of movies in general, but when it's the opening scene starts you off right in some of the action, and then it, like, rewinds, like... Five hours earlier. Like, I hate when movies do that. Like, they'll start you off in the middle of some sort of a climactic scene, and then it'll go back, like, five hours earlier. It's just, I hate when movies do that, because it's like, well, now I know partially what it's building to. I, I hate when movies do that, so a little knock against it for that, but it opens and closes with Bob O'Reilly, so I do have to give some pointers for that. But it's a fun watch. I like that one. And that was written by David Kep, and this was written and directed by David Kep as well, which is really weird going from this to this. <laughs> Stir of Echoes with Kevin Bacon. And I've been hearing about this one a lot throughout the years, how it's one of the most underrated ghost story films ever, and how it's awesome, and how it's haunting, and how it's chilling. Well, the comments I keep hearing is that this is one of the most underrated ghost story movies of all time. My comment to that was, I think this is one of the most overrated, underrated movies I've heard of. Because I went into this with pretty modest expectations. Like, oh, you know, Kevin Bacon, Dave Kester, Ghost Story. I love ghost movies. Okay, here we go. And it's all right. <laughs> like, I, it's fine, but it's a bit of a slow burn in places. And, you know, the storyline is interesting enough. And when the whole punchline of the mystery gets revealed, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's it? <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And I never felt creeped out by this. I never really felt any sense of atmosphere or dread. Kevin Bacon does fine. The actors all do fine, but I've seen a lot of ghost story movies that, in my opinion, blow the shit out of this. I, It's all right. <laughs> that the... It's not something I really have the urge to rewatch a lot. And now this one is very strange. This is an indie movie from like 2017. And I was curious enough about this. So I'm just like, oh, let's check this out. See what this is like. I, the plot just intriguing. And the way it looked, I'm like, okay, we got to see what the deal is with this. It's called Dave Made a Maze. It's this indie thing. And it, it came with a card. High five, Ken. Which, if, if you see the movie, you'll know why that says high five. This is visually, and from a production standpoint, this is one of the most impressive indie movies I've ever seen. Because they constructed all this stuff out of cardboard. The entire movie is cardboard and crafty and creative as all hell with some of the ideas. Like, they really had something here. And from a production standpoint, from a visual standpoint, that stuff with this is all phenomenal. But the characters and the writing is what kind of took me out of it. Like, this could have been a classic 
had they made... The problem is, you really don't like any of the characters, and I hate hipster stuff, and this movie is just drowning in hipster culture. And I'm just like... Ugh. Like, there's so much awesome, cool shit here with these traps and how it turns like... It's like cube with cardboard and like ribbon. It's really creative and it's really imaginative. But the characters suck and the whole hipster overtone to the dryness. I'm like, ugh. It's a mixed bag. You have an amazing production, visual, creative element to it. But then you get to the writing and the characters and it's like... If they would have just matched all of this up better, this could have been a classic. Um, so, like, the producer, the production designers, they all did phenomenal with this. Just the actors and the writing, I'm like, you, you, needed, you needed to revamp these characters. And maybe it's just me because I just don't like hipster <laughs> heavy stuff, and this is one of the most hipster things I've ever seen. But it's not without its merits. So go in, check it out. Just keep your expectations modest about it. In the last update, or two updates ago, or whenever the hell, I talked about Running Scared with Paul Walker, which I loved. So I went for the 80s movie, Running Scared. Always gotta love a movie set here in Chicago. Um, it's fun. You know, it's a buddy cop movie. It, it does Now, as someone, I've seen a ton of other buddy cop movies already. This one does absolutely nothing new, nothing different than any of the other ones you've seen. So, this movie doesn't give you anything new if you're already well-versed in the buddy cop genre, but at the same time, it doesn't do a bad job either. It's still entertaining, it's still fun to watch. Billy Crystal and uh, Gregory Hines, I don't know why I couldn't think of that, have wonderful chemistry. They're a lot of fun together. Just don't expect it to break any new ground. Never really heard of this one before, but the premise intrigued me. I'm like, okay, people getting killed on a couple's getaway in Hawaii. It's directed by David Tui, who I love. Did Below, one of my favorite ghost story movies ever, talking ghost story. I love Below. So I was excited to give this one a watch. A Perfect Getaway. And it stars Steve Zahn. How can you not love Steve Zahn? And he does really good in this. You know, he plays his typical, eccentric, Steve Zahn type here, but he gets a, a few more layers in this one, which is cool to see. Steve Zahn always does great. Timothy Oliphant does really good in this. And you even have a very early appearance by Chris Hemsworth. You know, he, before he became Thor, he was in a perfect getaway. Uh, there's the unrated and the theatrical version on here. I watched the unrated, which is ten minutes longer. I have no idea what the differences are between the unrated and the theatrical version, but I watched the unrated. And I, I thought it was fine, you know, it, it's not as good as Below, if I'm talking about David Tui stuff, it's, you know, it's not a groundbreaking thing, but there's some decent twists, even though some of them are a little predictable, like, you, like if you really stop and think about it, but it's satisfying, it's very satisfying in the execution, the Hawaiian setting is great. It delivers more here than if you watch Hard Ticket to Hawaii, for example. Steve Zahn, Timothy Oliphant, you know, you, you get a good thriller with this. I never heard it. I don't know if this was theatrical or, well, obviously it was theatrical. So there's a theatrical version on here. But I don't really remember seeing or hearing much press about this when it came out. So, But, no, it's, it's a good one. I like this one. Definitely recommend it. This one does not need any introduction whatsoever. The Rock. Nicolas Cage, Michael Bay, James Bond, you know, potentially Sean Connery. You could do all the research on that. How uh, There's videos on YouTube you could watch where they hyper-analyze the hell out of this to prove that the character Sean Connery plays in this is really James Bond. And it's fun to think about. Even, like, there's a scene with Sean Connery in this where he's in this crazy car chase. It does feel kind of Bondish, And... What can you say about The Rock? This movie's awesome. I've seen it before. I never owned the DVD of it, so I had to make up for lost time. I still need to pick up Con Air, another movie I love, I just don't own yet. Um, so, yeah. The Rock, it's badass. It's the best thing Michael Bay ever did. Um, yeah. 
I, I don't know what else I could say about this. The Rock, awesome movie. Now this was a blind buy. I got this for a dollar in the clearance bin. Never heard of this one before, but again, like I'm like, you got Pierce Brosnan, Woody Harrelson, Don Cheadle, Selma Hayek. Don Cheadle's not in it too much, but you know he's there. But it's called After the Sunset, which is another heist movie. Uh, Pierce Brosnan plays this diamond smuggler. He's always stealing diamonds, and Selma Hayek's his wife. The heist part of this movie is strangely the least interesting because they're stealing this diamond that's being kept on this cruise ship and you, know, you get the typical heist stuff. Where this movie really shines is just the chemistry between Pierce Brosnan and Woody Harrelson because they basically, this is almost like catch me if you can. Like that's kind of what it is and just the banter and the back and forth between Pierce Brosnan and Woody Harrelson. There's a scene where they're on a fishing boat that is absolutely hilarious and the payoff to it is just beautiful. So it's a fun, it's a fun watch for them. They make this movie worth it. All the actors make it worth it. The heist itself is where it just kind of loses interest and the, and the way it, it peers out I'm like eh. Loses a little bit of steam when you get towards the end. But that being said, I would have just rather seen a vacation comedy where Woody Harrelson and Pierce Brosnan just go to the islands together and it's just them on vacation as a comedy. Because like, those are the parts that shine the most in this. Um, funnily, I Love Tomorrow Never Dies with Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. And there's a scene in that where he has a remote control car. Well, he does pretty much the same thing in this, which I thought was funny. So, it's a fun movie. It's a fun watch. They're, Woody's and Pierce's chemistry is the best. So, just keep your expectations, you know, reasonable for the rest of it. But there's enough about this that made it fun that I enjoyed watching. There's a lot of cameos in that, too. So, I don't know what the deal was. And now, you know, every update I show a Gary Busey movie because I collect Gary Busey movies. Well, as of today, August 23rd, he's been in the news recently for uh, for some shit. And I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> so, so we won't touch on that bridge here. I'm just going to talk about the movie at hand, which is the only one out of this four-pack that I've watched so far. It's Bulletproof. The other movies here are Bamboo Gods and Iron Men, Trackdown, and Scorchy. They all sound pretty crazy, but so far Bulletproof is the only one I've watched, and it's the main one I got this set for, and Bulletproof is crazy. If you've seen that meme online with Gary Busey yelling at Danny Trejo, Your worst nightmare, butthorn! McBain! Yeah! Let eat McBain. Uh, this is crazy. They tried to make a Rambo movie with Gary Busey. Like, he goes to the... He goes to the Middle East or the jungle or wherever the hell it, it's set, L Libya, and there's there's this part with this hyper cyber kinetic technological tank that Gary Busey has to operate, and there's this woman, and it, there's this one part where he escapes by rolling down a hill, and he's calling everyone butthorn. There, I mean, bulletproof. It opens with an ice cream truck chase. You, you gotta. <laughs> You get so bulletproof. I had a hell of a lot of fun watching it. I I need to dig into these other three because if they're as crazy as bulletproof is, then I really need to get on this. This is an old uh, Shout Factory four pack. This came out. This is a 2013, so this came out a while ago. But yeah, check it out, Butthorn. If you could ignore what's going on in the news right now with its star. And uh, this is one I had not heard of too much, only a little bit, but I really liked the sound of the plot, so I'm like, oh, let's check this out. And this turned out to be really damn good. Like, I watched it, and I loved it. It's this thriller from the mid-90s called Mute Witness, which is like an American-slash-Russian production. If you read about the making of this, there, if you the production... And the story of how this film got made is as interesting as the movie itself. It's crazy. As well as how they got an uncredited role by Alec Guinness to be in this. He's not credited, but he's in it, you know, technically. And the story of how they got him is pretty crazy. But Mew Witness, speaking of Faceless, this is like, it's a mid-90s thriller, but it is absolutely like a 40s noir throwback and that's the best word I would use to describe this film is 
noir. It's very stylish with the vibrant colors, silhouettes. The everyone has these old cars and trench coats and hats. The way the cops look, it is such a 1940s noir film done in the 90s with a really good story. You have a character who's not deaf, but she's mute. She witnesses a snuff film being made, and the rest of the movie is just them coming after her and her trying to get her case out there and evade these bad guys and just all the shit that starts to domino effect from this and it gets crazy but i really enjoyed this it there's a lot of there's a few different plots going on you've got the villains that are trying to take her down you've got her who is just dying to be able to tell someone what's going on but she physically cannot tell anyone and I like how there's never a reason for why she's mute. Like, they don't waste time on any crazy backstory. She's just mute, and they leave it at that, which I appreciate. And the, the, it has a sense of humor, too. The movie will go back and forth. It'll get your guard down. It'll have these really goofy comic relief characters, like, in her... her uh, I forget what the connection was, like her friend and her friend's boyfriend. Because they all work on a movie set, so there's a lot of like movie within a movie stuff happening. And occasionally it'll go to like some really goofy side quest with these two other characters. But then when shit gets real, it catches you even more off guard. I, I really dug this. It ends kind of abruptly. I, I would have appreciated a little bit more tie around to... It, it felt like they were leaving some things unanswered by the ending, but when you hear about the story of how Alec Guinness and how their role came to be, that kind of makes sense, because they had to build this movie around footage they had. It, it's a whole story, but I if this ever gets a Blu-ray with special features, I will absolutely pick it up, because I thought this was fantastic. I greatly enjoyed Mute Witness. It's stylish, it's fun, it's vibrant, it's suspenseful. Great movie. I really like that one. And this one I, <laughs> I'd never seen before, so finally had to get I'd seen clips and heard quotes. Finally got around to seeing White Men Can't Jump, which is a blast. It, it, this movie is a ton of fun. By the time they got to the Jeopardy scene, I'm just like... <laughs> You know, some great one-liners, you know. Your mama's so poor, I seen her kicking a can down the street. When I asked her what she was doing, she said, moving. Just all these different lines and the physicality of Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson. And Woody had a lot of repeat faces in this update, but Woody Harrelson's a blast. And their chemistry, I'm not a big fan of Money Train. I, I thought that was a big, it could have been a lot better. It was disappointing. It was a big missed opportunity to make that really a cool movie, and they kind of wasted it on too much drama and busy work. But they nailed it here. I mean, Woody and Wesley are great together. It's funny. It's endearing. There's some good takeaways from it. I don't think it needs much introduction, but white men can't jump. Fun as hell time. Really liked it. <sighs> Talking without breathing here, guys. And I love these kinds of survival movies. This is another one from the dollar bin. Touching the Void. Which is funny because not only is this based off a true story, but the guys that this actually happened to are the guys that stunt double for themselves in the movie, which I thought was a cool touch, you know. Mountain climbing movies, outdoor survival, it's, I love this kind of stuff. And Touching the Void's no exception. This one did it really well. The way it's filmed, getting the actual guys to do their own stunts so you know they're getting... Yeah, there's Definitely if you watch the making of featurettes on here too. For a dollar, I mean, come on. Like You watch something like Frozen, or I recently saw this one in the theater called Fall, and... It, cliffhanger a lonely place to die like i love this kind of stuff i eat these kind of movies up and this one was great touching the void based on a true story too which is really what kind of sets some of them apart like 127 hours these next two were gifts from my friend ryan big game show guy first he wanted my thoughts on this tv miniseries called quiz all about a guy that has cheated who wants to be a millionaire in the UK and took home the grand prize? 
and it's a crazy story. So it's a mini series. So this is, it's it's lengthy. It's 152 minutes to get through it all. But you read about this guy because I remember talking with Ryan about that. And like after this guy got busted for cheating on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, he he had his toe cut off in a lawnmower accident. Like it's a weird story involving this guy. There was a scandal back in the 80s on Press Your Luck with a guy that figured out the board sequence on Press Your Luck and, like, scammed the show. It, there's a lot of interesting stuff when you read about these game show scams and, and whatnot. And this was, I didn't even know this existed. He just abruptly sent it to me in a package. And, so uh, you know, it, it's a cool time, you know. It's 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 interesting. And, uh, you know, I like game shows. I like watching game shows. So this was, you know, cool stuff, cool miniseries. And Ryan's piece de resistance that he sent me. Last October when Jason and I were on vacation in Iceland, it was 2 a.m. and I had to be up for our Golden Circle tour the next morning at 7 a.m. And so, like, something was on the TV and I switched the channel because I'm like, okay, I, I need to get to bed. I don't want to get sucked into whatever and stay up all night. Well, I switched it to ITV and... I ended up staying up and watching this game show episode because we got a UK channels there in our Iceland hotel room. And this game show was on called Rolling In It. And I, here I am at 2 a.m. I'm like, I need to get to sleep. But I got sucked into watching this show. And it was hilarious. The host, the contestants, the celebrity. Because each there's three teams. It's a contestant paired with a celebrity. And they have to roll this coin down the conveyor belt into a slot with a monetary amount to answer a question to get that money. It's called rolling in it. And I was talking to Ryan. I'm like, we got to find this episode that I saw. It was so funny. I need to see more of this show because it never aired anywhere here in the U.S. It's not really on YouTube. At least not full episodes. Well, Ryan working his magic, he found the entire six episode run of series one and burned them to this so we've got rolling in it volume one volume two and volume three and sure enough the episode i saw in iceland is series one episode three with john thompson joe swash and vic hope and yeah so what every single episode of this show was absolutely hilarious. The the show has a sense of humor to it. It's got that British wit all over it, the way everyone acts. One episode had a contestant, his occupation was chimney sweep, and he was dressed like he was in the nineteen twenties. Like it was I'm like, what? Like, he really stands out. And there's another one where this uh, comedian was on there named Jimmy Carr, and he was hilarious. I, the things that I did not expect to come home from Iceland with, and now I've got, like, a new favorite game show with Rolling in it. Such a blast. Thank you so much, Ryan, for sending me the complete Series 1 on these DVDs. And, yeah, Rolling in it. Rolling in it. Almost done, guys. Just got some TV show stuff now. Mythbusters, mega movie myths. Again, got this for a buck. And this was cool, them debunking movie myths. So, like, falling from a roof through all the awnings and everything. If you could survive this. Doing the Indiana Jones thing. Doing the Dukes of Hazard car hop thing. Just doing all these movie stunts. And I always liked Mythbusters, you know, during daytime TV when you were a kid, when nothing else was on, you know, you could put Discovery Channel on and you'd get like Mythbusters or Cash Cab or, you know, stuff like that. And so I've always enjoyed Mythbusters. I don't own any of it, but whenever I caught it, I enjoyed Mythbusters. So it, it, cool show to watch. And I, I like, I figured this one was right up my alley doing the movie stuff. Definitely worth your time. It's a fun one. And... You guys know me, I've been going through It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Well, we're almost caught up. This is seasons 11, 12, and 13. So we're getting there. And this is when they started doing all the DVDs, MOD, so you can see they have manufactured on demand. They're all the same. The menus are just bare basic. And, you know, it, so there's no bonus features or anything on any of these. Fun episodes, though. 
Uh, season 11, uh, this has the courtroom episode, McPoyle versus Ponderosa, the Bird Law episode, that one's a classic. It has the crazy two-part finale where the gang go on a cruise ship and they die, and it's this two-parter that's absolutely crazy. Uh, Mac and Dennis move to the suburbs is kind of a funny little commentary, a lot of dark humor in that one. And of course, the gang hits the slopes, where they parody every 80s ski movie cliche there is. It's fun. So, season 11 is definitely an upper tier season. I had a lot of fun with this one. And season 12 came after that. I need to look at the list here, guys, just because I need to refresh my memory what episode was what season. Uh, Making Dennis Reynolds a Murderer, that was a fun document, you know, when... Um, that making a murderer documentary was really popular and stuff. Hero or Hate Crime, that's an interesting one. Another legal-tinged episode. A Cricket's Tale, the, the, the typical dark humor route for the character of Cricket. And, uh, oh yeah, and the, uh, <laughs> the title of the first episode on here is The Gang Turns Black. That sums it up right there for season 12. The weird one is season 13, because I don't know what the hell happened. The cliffhanger of season 12, spoiler alert, I guess, is that Dennis moved away and left the show. Well, season 13, I don't know what the order is that these are on the DVD, but they are all out of order. Because there's five episodes that Dennis is not in, which should be the first five episodes of the season. But no, they, they start the season with the episode where he comes back, so it's very anticlimactic, and it's all out of order. Like, there's an episode where they're, uh, they're at the Super Bowl, or they're at, the, I don't know if it's the Super Bowl or if it's a, it's a football game, but they reference events that technically haven't happened yet, but that's because the episodes were aired out of order. Like, it's really weird. I... And season 13 so far is probably the weakest season I've come across. There's a lot of heavy-handed social messaging to this season that was always kind of there, but a bit heavier in this regard. The episode Mac Finds His Pride, I know that's a very high... That episode takes a really odd just turn for the final act. I don't know if I'm the right type of person to be commenting on that episode, it, you know, just not me, so I don't know if it's my room to talk, but it didn't really do anything for me, <laughs> that, that episode, I just thought the delivery of it was strange. The one saving grace, the gang gets new wheels. If you've seen that episode, the gang gets new wheels, you know, the scene with Mac and Charlie that you would never see today. You know the scene I'm talking about. That almost makes it all worth it. Though the gang gets new wheels. That episode is easily the season 13 highlight. Like that episode was fantastic. So. Charlie's Home Alone is okay. And the gang wins the big game. Like those are fun. Like again because they kind of pushed a, a lot of the social stuff. Yeah. So the gang gets new wheels. Charlie's Home Alone and the gang wins. The, those ones are fun. Because Charlie's Home Alone and the gang wins the big game. They're like a two-parter, but it's the same story happening at different times. So it's cool to see that. I like that one. So, a few misses on this season, if you ask me. But those three episodes are fantastic. And season 12. And then my favorite of these three was easily Season 11. Great stuff on here. Alright, guys. I have a little stack of stuff from Flashback Weekend that I still need to watch, so those will all be in the next update, October, November, I don't know, we'll see how it goes, got a lot of stuff coming up, so stay tuned to the channel here, you'll be seeing a lot from me soon, hope you enjoyed it, take care, and we'll talk to you later, thanks guys.